Thank you for coming. We're so excited to have Jody Blanco here at St. Joe. To, we should talk to our children this morning and to give a presentation tonight to our parents to talk about the effects of bullying, the effect it had on her life, and the things we can do to heal from that and to prevent it in others. She's meeting with the teachers and doing great things to help us at St. Joe to grow and be better in our emotional intelligence, to be better people, and to help treat others better. So I welcome Jody Blanco. Thank you. Hi everyone, it's good to be with you. And I do have a question before we begin, Terry. Do I need the microphone or am I better without it? Okay, no problem. Hi everybody, my name is Jody. From fifth grade through high school, I was the kid that nobody wanted to be caught dead hanging out with. I cried myself to sleep for the same reason that maybe some students here struggle to fit into, simply for being different. My school years were a nightmare. I never imagined that I would write a book about those experiences. When I wrote Please Stop Laughing at Me, I never imagined it would become a New York Times bestseller. This was long before the anti-bullying movement. In fact, my book helped to start that movement. And I became the first adult to ever look back on her experiences as a student who was bullied and use those experiences turning that pain into purpose. That was 20 years ago, and for the last over two decades, I've been traveling to schools, sharing my message to save lives. I do a program called INJA. It's not just joking around. That consists of stu student presentations, professional development, a parent family seminar, a social emotional learning curriculum, and white papers and other resources for teachers. Something amazing has happened. Now, I've done this program in hundreds of schools for tens of thousands of people. And something amazing has happened along the way. And I am going to ask a technical question in between. Terry, is it better if I'm looking at you over there? Is it better if I'm looking in the seats? What is going to give me the most contact? OK, thank you. I want to make sure, everyone, that we're connecting as much as possible and that even though you're with me remotely I want to be able to feel your energy and connect with all my heart so that's why I ask these technical questions something amazing happened as I've been touring America's schools when I was a kid and the bullying was at its worst there were certain things the adults in my life meaning my teachers and parents and principals did that were helpful but other things that made my life worse. And I remember them distinctly. And when I started asking kids that question about how the grown-ups were helpful and how they maybe weren't so helpful, all the answers they gave me were exactly what I used to say in my journals 30, 40 years earlier. And I realized something. The world may change. But the heart of a child beats the same. It longs for acceptance. And if you deny that child that acceptance, something inside them can shatter like glass. And they can spend the rest of their lives trying to pick up the shards of glass and reassemble their self-esteem. My job as an activist and an expert and a speaker is to prevent the shattering of that glass. So let me share with you what we're going to do tonight. And I hope that your kids are with you. And if they're not, I encourage you to ask them to join you. Because what I'm going to share with you tonight, they are going to be my co-teachers. And I'm going to share with you all the things that your kids want you to understand about how they see the world and how they think especially when it comes to bullying. These are things they're either afraid to tell you or they feel, but they don't quite know how to express yet. 
Now, if I have any kids watching, kids, here all this, here's how this is going to work. You're going to be my co-teachers for the first part of the seminar. And here's what I need you to do. I am going to list the things that a parent should never say to a bully child. Now, if any of the things on my list are things that your parents have said to you, this is what I want you to do. I want you to tug on their sleeve with a smile and with love, and I want you to look at them and say, see, I was right and you were wrong. Now, I want you to do this with love and respect and a smile. Parents, I want you to enjoy this. Because as adults, we're always teaching kids. But how wonderful is it when our kids can teach us? So let's begin. Kids, are you ready to tug? Are you ready? Let's go. These are the things that you should never say to a bully child and why. Ignore the bullies and walk away. Why is that not great advice? First of all, in the world of grown-ups, if you ignore someone who's annoying you, they'll stop. But in the world of kids, it's the opposite. We can't enforce adult logic onto kids because it will never, ever work. In the world of kids, if your child is being bullied and you tell them to ignore the bully, those bullies will get meaner until they elicit a response. There are two types of popular kids in a school. The elite leader is a caring, inclusive member of the cool crowd. Then you have the elite tormentor. The elite tormentor is the mean member of the popular group. They're the ones who will get everyone in a friend group to turn on one person for no reason. They'll start nasty drama just to see how far they can take it. Beware of the elite tormentors in your communities, everyone. Sometimes these are the kids that the parents are the most proud of never imagining that they're sending home other kids in tears every day, not by virtue of the acts of cruelty they commit, as much as the acceptance they very subtly deny. Well, if you have a group of elite tormentors, or even a single elite tormentor, picking on an established target, someone they always pick on, if that target ignores those elite tormentors, it's a guarantee they will up the volume on their cruelty. Additionally, what's the one thing that we tell kids all over? Don't be a bystander. If you see somebody getting bullied, stand up and defend that person. Then why is it? that will turn around and say to that very same child, oh, you're being bullied? Just ignore it and walk away. Isn't that a mixed message? Aren't we, in effect, asking that child to be a bystander in their own life? And then we wonder why kids get frustrated with us. We wonder why that same child, as an adult, will be taken advantage of by everyone. Because we fed that child a cliche that if we're really honest with ourselves, probably didn't work when we were kids either. The second thing you should never say to a bully child is, leave them alone and they'll leave you alone. Why? There are two types of bullied students in a school. The overtly bullied is the child who's bullied in all the obvious ways. Cyber bullied, made fun of, physically harassed. And then you have the invisible student. The invisible student isn't necessarily bullied per se or excluded on purpose. They're just not on anyone's social radar. They're that kid that sort of just disappears into the woodwork. And if you tell an invisible student to leave them alone and they'll leave you alone, do you know what they feel in their heads? What they say inside to themselves? I don't want to be left alone. I'm already lonely. I don't want the popular kids to leave me alone. I want them to like me. I want them to include me. I hate grown-ups. They don't understand anything. 
The third thing you should never say to a bully child, and this is the one that always bothered me the most, always. They're just jealous. It's just jealousy. You threaten them so they put you down to build themselves up. They're just jealous. Why is that a wrong thing to say? Every time a well-meaning adult said that to me, in my head I would scream, who cares why I don't fit in? Who cares the reason? That's all adults do is talk and blah, blah, blah. I don't want any more adult explanations. I want action. Just tell me what to do so I can get invited to a party this weekend. And I also used to think, why is it that the adults always expect the victims of bullies to be the bigger people? Why do they always say things to us like, turn the other cheek, rise above it, consider the source, don't give them the satisfaction, be the bigger person? Why doesn't anyone ever seem to ask the mean kids to be the bigger people? Why is all that pressure on us? I mean, isn't it bad enough that we're all freaked out and stressed out about just getting from homeroom to social studies without being spat on or worse, and now we have to pretend to rise above it because deep down we know we can't, but we at least better pretend because if we don't, then the adults are going to be disappointed in us and they won't like us anymore either. Grown-ups don't understand. Now, why do we find ourselves using this cliche on bullied kids? It's because we believe that if we can give this child a logical reason why he or she struggles to fit in, that they can process intellectually they will take the bullying less personally and it will hurt less because if it were we, that's what we would feel. If somebody gave us a logical reason why someone at work didn't like us that had really nothing to do with us that we could just process intellectually, we'd feel better about it too. But once again, you're imposing adult logic onto kids and it will never work. They are a different galaxy. They see things through a different lens. And the reason that it won't work, they're just jealous, is because you're expecting that child to think and process emotion like an adult, as you would. And a child cannot think like an adult or process emotion like an adult until they reach the age of emotional maturity, which is a neurological event at which point the brain completes, the frontal lobe of the brain completes its development. Until then, no child can process emotion like an adult. Now, most of us know this on some level then why is it that we believe that our child is the exception to that maturity rule? Because 95% of all bullied students fit into one typical character profile that I call the ancient child. You might use the term old soul. You guys know this kid. The ancient child is the child who is typically more verbally, socially, and intellectually sophisticated than their peers. They often have an extraordinary vocabulary, and they articulate themselves with sanguinity. In fact, when you talk to an ancient child, Sometimes you have to pinch yourself and remind yourself that you're actually talking to a kid because they're so wise and mature on the outside. The ancient child also exhibits a compassion and an empathy and a sensitivity far beyond their years. Sometimes they're tragically mislabeled overly sensitive. 
they're not overly sensitive. It's just that if you compare them to their mainstream counterpart who aren't sensitive enough, they seem, by comparison, overly sensitive. So what do we as a global culture, culture do? Instead of trying to make the less sensitive kids more mindful and more sensitive, we make the ones who are sensitive and mindful feel like there's something wrong with them. And my question is, what's wrong with us? The ancient child will beg their parents to stay up late if they're having a party because they feel more comfortable with adults than kids. The ancient child will beg you not to worry about them if no one will sit with them at lunch and tell you that, well, my classmates are too immature anyways. Don't believe it. I don't care how mature that kid is on the outside. Inside, they are just as desperate to fit in as any other kid the same age. And we don't care the reasons why we don't fit in. We just want action. The ancient child sees the world through an adult lens but they experience feelings through the reality of their biological age. And they struggle everywhere. The fourth thing you should never say to a bully child is, and there's lots of versions of this, but this is the one I got. So kids, you have to use your imagination. Jody. 20 years from now, you are going to be a famous writer and all these kids who are picking on you are going to be in jail or worse. And every time a well-meaning adult said that to me, I used to think, who cares about 20 years from now? Who cares about when I grow up or when I'm older? I hurt now. Everybody's going to the mall after school, and nobody invited me. What do I care about when I'm in college or when I'm older? I want to die now. To a kid, the future is after school, and the distant future is who they're going to hang out with on Saturday. And the last thing you should never say to a bully child is, I know how you feel. It never failed. I would finally find the courage to confide in an adult. And I barely get two sentences out, and the well-meaning adult would interrupt, adults, we think you're too interrupty. The well-meaning adult would interrupt and say, oh, sweetheart, I know how you feel. When I was in seventh grade, and off they'd go. And the whole conversation would be about when they were in seventh grade. And I'd always wonder, why does every conversation with a grown-up always somehow end up being about the grown-up's childhood? Gosh, they're annoying. So what should you do? And what should you say? Before I walk you through how to intervene with a child in crisis one-on-one, -on -one, I want to talk to you about the difference between authority and emotional credibility. Authority is what you have over a child. Emotional credibility is when that child feels safe because they know they can trust you. One of the biggest challenges for step-parents is they'll walk into a family situation and they have authority, so they automatically assume it gives them emotional credibility. It doesn't. This requires patience, effort, and you have to earn it. There are three tenets of emotional credibility in communication. Now these work with adults too, but they're especially powerful with children. Tenet number one of emotional credibility in communication, specificity. The more specific you are when you communicate with a child, the more validated they feel. The more general you are, the more dismissed they feel. That's why if you ask a kid, what's the one thing grown-ups say that bothers you the most? They will almost all tell you when I ask for something and my parents say, we'll see. 
because they know that we'll see is grown up code for I don't want to be bothered right now. I don't want to make a commitment to anything right now. And even though it's not your intention, you're just trying to buy yourself a little time, even though it's not your intention, that child feels this big. A far better alternative would be to look at your child in the eyes and say, I can't give you an answer right this second. I need time to process my decision. Let's you and I agree on a time to meet again tomorrow, at which point I'll give you my decision. But before we leave here, I'd like you to explain specifically to me, say to your child, why this thing you're asking is important to you. And then let your child explain. Don't judge, don't interrupt, don't sigh, don't give away your feelings with your body language. Just sit very quietly and listen and nod. When they've completed their reason of why, say to them, thank you for sharing that information with me. It will play an important role in my final decision. Then the next day, when you give your child your decision, if the answer is yes, explain specifically why, how you got there. If the answer is no, explain specifically how you got to the no. The child's real reward isn't the yes, if that ends up being your answer. It's that you were specific in your decision-making process. You allowed the child to participate in that process. You were specific on your timeline. You were specific about how you got to your conclusion. You also, in the process, taught your child about prioritization, thinking things through, making judgments about what's important and what's not. And you gave yourself the same wiggle room as we'll see because you didn't commit to anything specific, yet you used specificity to make that child feel validated instead of dismissed. Does that make sense? The second tenet of emotional credibility in communication is immediacy. If you're dealing with a child in crisis, they need to hear words out of your mouth that suggest you have internalized the urgency of their pain. Words like, immediately, right now, today, this minute, this afternoon. The biggest complaint I get from kids everywhere is that they feel like they're not like an emotional priority. Immediacy vocabulary gives them that feeling. Now, if some of you are thinking, well, that's great, but my kid is dramatic all the time. My kid is constantly starving for attention. They won't leave me alone. And everything is a big deal to my kid. If you're dealing with a child who's chronically attention-seeking and for whom everything is a huge, urgent deal, that's a symptom of a hunger. That's a symptom of something larger. There's a hunger there. There's a hole there. Instead of being annoyed by the behavior, address and fill the hunger and then deal with the behavior if it's even still there. The third tenet of emotional credibility in communication is my very favorite as a professional writer. Positioning and semantics. Simply put, present it the way you want it perceived. When you communicate, think through how you're going to present what you want to say. Be positive. Look at the positive component and not the negative. And I'll illustrate that more as we go. So, how do you intervene with a bully child or even a bully one-on-one -on -one while simultaneously reinforcing emotional credibility? Step number one, you're going to sit down with your child. When you sit down with your child, make sure your child knows that no one is getting up off the chairs until your child talks to you. Eventually, they will say something if for no other reason to be granted escape. And no matter what they say, there's going to be some element of confessional truth in it. You just have to be able to interpret it from a more creative, whimsical point of view.
Also, when you sit down with your child, do it someplace at home that they don't associate with serious talks or discipline. Do it someplace that's fun and relaxed, not someplace that has a stigma of this is where we do our serious talks. And be aware of your body language. Don't cross your legs. Don't slouch. Just sit up straight. Turn off all your devices. No one should have any devices on. And just connect. Step number two. You say to your child, I don't know how you feel. I can't imagine what you're going through. It must be awful. I don't know how you feel. I can't imagine what you're going through. It must be awful. And then let your child vent. There's going to be an awkward silence. Breathe through it. Sometimes when a child is opening up for the first time about being bullied or anything sort of cathartic, something else will slip out that they didn't intend to say that normally they might be punished for. Example, well, when I was in the bathroom sticking a vape with Brianna, Amber came in and she... Oh. Don't stop the intervention. I don't care what your child says that accidentally slips out. I don't care. Let them keep venting. Just pretend like you didn't even hear it. Because if you interrupt the intervention for whatever it was they said, it will inhibit them from opening up to you again. Let it go. Just wait till the end of the intervention. And at the end of the intervention, address it as an advocate, not an authoritarian. And say to your child, that thing that accidentally slipped out, I'm not going to punish you for that because I'm so proud of you for opening up to me. But let you and I come up with a three-point plan of action on how we can work together to help you avoid making that mistake again. Because if you do, then we will have to discipline you. So step number one, you've gotten the child to open up. Step number two, Step number two, you've, you've made your child feel safe. Next, you say, let's talk about an action that we can take together today to address this challenge. Let's talk about an action that we can take together today to address this challenge. Now let's break that down in terms of our tenets. Let's talk. It's specific. Let's think about some things we can do as a turnoff for kids because kids don't want to think when they're in pain. They want action. And most kids think grown-ups are too thinky to begin with. So let's talk, that's active, about an action, a specific action where that child can say to themselves, my parents said they were going to take a specific action this is the specific action they took, and this is the specific result that we can take together, reinforcing advocacy today, our immediacy vocabulary, validating for our child that they are an emotional priority for us. To address this challenge, when you use the word challenge, it makes everyone want to rise up and seize the reins and conquer the challenge versus when you use the word problem, it makes everyone retreat and recoil. Positioning and semantics, tenant number three. Let's talk about an action that we can take together today to address this challenge. Okay, now you've gotten your child to open up. You've made them feel safe. You've promised to take a specific action what action do you take? The single biggest mistake that most adults make when dealing with a bullying-related situation, and it's well-intentioned and done with love, but it often leads to tragic results. You find out that your child is being bullied or invisibilized, and so you immediately immediately spring into action. You talk to the principal and the superintendent and the school counselor. You demand a meeting with the parents of the bullies. Your whole focus is on punishing the bullies. Sometimes parents will become so frustrated they end up bullying the school to punish the bullies. So everyone's focus is on appropriate punishment for those bullies. Everyone's focused over here. 
Meanwhile, over here, bleeding emotionally is that bully child. There's a myth that bullied students who do tragic things, who end their own lives, do so because of the bullying. That's a myth, because I was one of the kids that attempted it, and I hold hundreds of kids in my arms who felt like I did. It's not the bullying itself that drives these kids to tragic extremes. That's not the final straw. It's the loneliness. It's the isolation. It's that feeling that nobody understands me. Not my parents, not the kids at school, not my teachers. Nobody gets me. So what difference does it make if something happens to me? Because no one's ever going to get me anyways. It's that sense of hopelessness and despair because you feel as if no one, absolutely no one, really gets you. The first thing you need to do if you're a parent and you find out that your child is being bullied or invisibilized is perform triage. Triage consists of one simple word. Hope. You need to give your child hope that if they're not fitting in at school, that there is some place where they can connect with their age group and feel belonging. I recommend that you sit down with your child and you Google organized activities for kids in your community. Start with the park district, local library, chamber of commerce, 4-H clubs. They have a ton of stuff from teen community theater and dance to art clubs, botany clubs. Then try the private sector, dance studios, rock fantasy camps, drama clubs, readers theater. There's so much. And let your child Find something that would excite them. There's also online communities for kids that are safe and vetted for every interest imaginable. And they have meetings and they have gatherings. And as COVID recedes, more things will happen in person. But you have to find your child or help your child to find a brand new social outlet completely separate from school. If you have to, go one parish over or one school district or one neighborhood over. So it's a guarantee that your child will make new friends with new faces. This activity will give your child more social confidence, which will make them less of a target at school. Also, it will make your child less desperate to connect with their classmates. And as their desperation diminishes and that awkward tension diminishes, their classmates will often come around. And on the days when school is really lonely, it gives them something to look forward to, where they can belong somewhere. And it will give you the time you need to deal with this over here. Because I'm not saying that we shouldn't discipline the bully. I'm not saying we shouldn't deal with that. But if you're excited because a meeting has been scheduled on Thursday at 2 with everyone, administrators, parents of the bullies, parents of the victims, and everyone wants to work together, and it's really awesome, and you're feeling good about that, and that meeting is scheduled for Thursday at 2 and Wednesday night at 11, that lonely child does something tragic, is anyone going to remember about the meeting on Thursday? Now, what do you do if your child is the bully or the elite tormentor? How do you handle it? And what do you do if you're a parent and you've got an elite tormentor or a bully putting your child through hell. How do you handle it? How do you control your rage? What do you do? How does the bully think? What's going on with the bully? How do you navigate that?
traditional punishment alone doesn't work. It only makes an angry child angrier and an insensitive child more insensitive. We must supplement traditional punishment with more compassionate, restorative forms of discipline. That should be our go-to, and punishment should be the last resort, and not the other way around. I know that if you're a parent and your child is being bullied, or it's a situation where you've got an elite tormentor, she's getting everybody in your child's friend group to turn on your child, and your child has nowhere to go because her friends are too scared to do anything because they're scared they'll get kicked out of the group too. That's a typical situation, right? And I know that you're so angry at what they're doing to your child that you're sick. You're sick inside. But look at me. It may seem like that bully's actions are a personal act of cruelty against your child. That they're trying to hurt your kid on purpose. I promise you, that's not the case. The bully is almost always a child in pain acting out in a cry for help. When I was in seventh grade, there was this boy named Jerry, and he was being abusive to a developmentally disabled student, and I stopped him, and he got in trouble. Jerry didn't like that, so he got all of his friends to jump me after school in a snowstorm, hold me down, and shove snow down my throat, my ears, my shirt, until I was choking, and then they left me there. I wanted him punished, and so did my parents. And we pushed and pushed and pushed the school. And so the principal gave Jerry's friends a week in school suspension. They gave Jerry five days at home because he was the instigator. Over 20 years later, when I went to my high school reunion, which is a whole other story of miraculousness, I bumped into Jerry's best friend, who said that he read my book and it made him start to think about our childhood. And he recalled something he hadn't realized. About the same time that Jerry pulled that on me, that was the same time that his mom left the family, abandoned them. The dad started drinking and lost his job. And no one was caring for or feeding those kids. There were seven kids in Jerry's family. And come to think of it, his friend said, all those kids were so skinny like they never ate. He said, and that night when we had that snowball fight, after we left you, we went to my house for SpaghettiOs. And Jerry ate like he'd never eaten in his life. And then he licked our plates clean. And we all laughed, thinking he was just being a smart aleck. And when his friend said that, the room began to spin. Because I remembered, gee whiz, when Jerry came back from serving that suspension, he was so thin he looked like he had cancer. And no one paid any attention. Jerry didn't pick on me because he hated me. He was hungry and he was too ashamed to ask the school for help. So we acted out in a cry for help. And how did we answer that cry? We subjected him to further starvation. There was this girl, Nadia, and she was my arch enemy all through school. She was horrible to me. The meanest thing she ever did. My senior year of high school. She invited me to a cool kid party. I was so excited. I spent all day getting ready. And when I got to the address that she gave me, it wasn't anybody's house. It was a parking lot at a forest preserve. And all the kids came out and they were laughing and they were like, yeah, like we'd ever invite you to anything. And they left me standing there like an idiot. I wanted her punished. I prayed that she would get hers. The night of my high school reunion, the night she apologized to me for that, 
I found out from a friend of hers that that was around the same time her dad took his own life when she was alone with him in the house. And her mother told her to just tell everyone he had a heart attack. Can you imagine what that poor girl was carrying? Now, I'm not saying that if someone is bullying your child that it makes it okay if they're going through something awful, but it does make it easier to forgive. So if your child is being bullied, be curious. Find out as much about that bully's backstory as you physically can. Because the more you discover, the more compassion you'll feel for the bully. And the more compassion you'll f you feel for your child's bully, the more effectively that you'll be able to work in partnership with the school to answer the bully's cry for help and stop their hurting so they stop hurting your child. It will also help the bully practice remorse, it will help your child practice forgiveness and tolerance, and whole new pathways of healings can occur. What do you do if your kid's the bully? What do you do if your kid is an elite tormentor in training? Let's say that you have a 13-year-old boy and he's being disrespectful lately to his grandparents. So you say to him, either you show your grandparents more respect or I'm confiscating your iPhone. He doesn't. He's 13. So you take his iPhone. And then two days later, he's mowing his grandparents' lawn and watching Lawrence Welk with them on PBS. Isn't that a bum deal for the grandparents? They're not getting quality time with their grandson because he wants to be there. They're just getting it because he wants his iPhone back. So your traditional approach to punishment has set the subliminal precedent that his iPhone, his relationship with his iPhone, has the exact corresponding value to his relationship with his living grandparents and that he can exchange one for the other like a barter. And then we wonder why our world is so materialistic. We are establishing that precedent even though we mean well. A much better approach would be to hand that 13-year-old boy a notebook and a pen and say, for the next five days, you're going to perform one unexpected act of kindness for a different person each day. Immediately upon completion of each act, you're writing down what you did, how that person responded, and how that made you feel. Then you're going to hand the notebook to this person, have them sign it, date it, and provide a nighttime phone number or a cell number, recipients under 18, parental signature, and cell required. I want this notebook in five days, and I'm calling everyone to verify that you complied. If I find out that you haven't, this will be the result. And then you would usher in a more traditional form of punishment. Let's say that you have a child and you're, and you're concerned lately because when they see homeless people, they don't seem very empathetic. And you've heard your child laughing with their friends about their lesser fortunate classmates who wear hand-me-downs instead of new clothes. And it's starting to make you nervous. You can't punish empathy into a child. It's not going to work. But you can do this. And let... Let's say that you have a good kid, but like, how can you look at someone who's begging on the street and not feel anything? So as a family, go to a nearby homeless shelter, food bank, or soup kitchen and serve the people there. And your child has to talk to them about their dreams and aspirations. Write a letter of encouragement to someone there and come up with an idea of how you as a family can make the people who live there or use that facility feel humanized. Maybe you put on a family talent show or maybe you rent a karaoke machine and bring it there one night or maybe as a family you paint a beautiful mural in the front foyer. But I promise you this, if you've got a child who isn't sensitive towards the lesser fortunate, if you take the time to expose them to people who have so little, 
They will never make fun of the kids who shop at Goodwill instead of pink again. Let's say that you have a 13-year-old daughter and your 13-year-old daughter has just informed you that she's not inviting her best friend ever since kindergarten to the sleepover on Friday. And you're aghast. And you ask her why. And she says, well, you know, her new friend group, they don't like her. And like, ew, if I invite her, like, my new friends are going to like think that's like really gross. And you're listening and you're thinking, oh my God, what's happening? What are you going to do? Force your daughter to invite her best friend since kindergarten to that sleepover? Do you know what they'll do to that girl? I was that girl and you don't want to make that girl that girl. Are you going to punish her into hanging out with her best friend again? And then she perceives spending time with her as a form of punishment? None of that is going to work. Now, what's the one thing you want for this child? And for really any child, you want your daughter, you want your children to know what it's like to be loved unconditionally, for others to love them unconditionally as you do. Well, in order to receive unconditional love, no matter what age you are, you need to have tolerance and compassion in your heart. And tolerance and compassion aren't qualities that you can punish into a kid. You have to inspire them by your own example. Now, there are lots of ways to inspire tolerance and compassion and to exemplify unconditional love. I'm just going to give you one example to get your creative juices flowing. Now, I preface this with, and your kids know this, I'm a huge animal lover, okay? I'm over the top, eccentric, and beyond. So I always dedicate a portion of my talk for supporting animals. Now, I think animals are a great way to teach kids unconditional love and compassion. So I use this only as an example of how compassionate discipline and the construct works. So let's go back to our 14-year-old elite tormentor in training girl. Instead of punishing her, because it's not going to work, or bribing her, it's not going to work, try this. Say to her, let's adopt a pet. And then as a family, go to a local animal shelter. And when you walk in, say to the manager, our family would like to adopt a pet, and we would like the pet who's been here the longest that no one wants. When the manager says, don't you want to walk up and down the rows of cages and pick your pet, you say no, because you don't want to reinforce that example of conditional love. You don't want to pick a pet the way your daughter is picking who's cool enough to come to her sleepover. You want to set an example of unconditional love. And when that manager brings out that fur ball, I don't care if it's a bald, toothless, flatulent, three-legged, 16-year-old mutt. You give that fur ball love and affection. And you let your child bear witness to what happens when a spirit that's been abused and dismissed the same way your daughter is dismissing and forgetting her best friend finally gets the love and acceptance they hunger for. If you want your children to be more grateful, engage in gratitude practices. The next time you're out shopping or at a McDonald's with your kids, and you see a janitor bend over and pick up garbage off the floor, get up out of your seat, walk over to that janitor, introduce yourselves to him, thank him for keeping your local McDonald's so clean, and then, with your child, ask for the manager of that store. Say that you want to compliment that janitor, and how can you write a note to your boss's boss to compliment that janitor? How often do kids see us complain about bad service, and how often do they see us celebrate good service and acknowledge the people who deserve it, who nobody ever gives any credit to? If you want your children to be more real, be more real with them. The next time you're in a bad mood, instead of trying to hide it and then snapping at them anyways, and then they take it personally, and then you feel guilty, and then things devolve from there, be honest with your kid. 
Say, hey, I have a yucky day at work. I'm in a totally crabby mood. So let's do something fun. If you can think of something to make me laugh, can be a funny story, a joke, anything. We can have anything to we can have anything for dinner tonight you want, even Snickers bars or whatever it is your reward system is at home. Now look at what you've done there. First of all, you've shown your child that you're human. You know, a lot of kids don't think adults are human. You have to remind them. Also, you've allowed your child to lift you up. You're teaching your child empathy. And if you do end up snapping at them later in the evening or not being as patient as you should be, your child doesn't wonder if they did something wrong or take it personally or to heart because they just know mommy or daddy is in a bad mood. And so it doesn't affect their esteem. And parents, whether you may be the parent of a child who's being bullied or excluded or invisibilized, or whether you're the parent of the kids who are doing that, work together in partnership. No child is ever mean because they want to be mean. They're mean because they're hurting inside and they're asking for help. Answer that cry together. You chose Catholic school for your children because you wanted them to learn in an environment of tolerance and civility and forgiveness and kindness. So what better way to reinforce those qualities than to practice it yourself with your children's bullies? Because if you set the example, then you are setting the example for everyone. And when you do decide on a disciplinary implementation, make sure there's an element of it that allows that bully to experience the joy of doing the right thing and not just the consequence of doing the wrong thing. That's how you stop the bullying cycle. By finding the goodness in the bully, by finding the goodness in the victim, and by innovating ways in which their goodness can transform the entire school culture, one child at a time. Now, if anyone is interested in having me come and speak or just wants to reach out to me or communicate with me, my website is jodeblanco.com, J-O-D-E-E-B-L-A-N-C-O.com. And my email is jody at jodyblanco.com. I respond to all of my emails personally and I respond pretty quickly. And if you need an ear, I'm here. And I also want to thank the administration here at St. Joe and I want to thank the, thank the staff and the diocese for trusting me. That's not something I take lightly. I take it very, very seriously. Thank you for loving your kids, for listening to me, and for being the bright light of hope that I know each and every one of you is. Thank you. Now what happens? I just say thank you because I am the high school director. Oh, wonderful. Dana okay. had a meeting that she had to go to. Okay. So, um, thank you and good night. <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much for coming. How do I turn this off, Terry? Okay, Dina said there was.